afternoon. Um, thank you very much for your attendance today. I'm very grateful. Um, I, my topic addresses the seminar series theme of challenging times in that I think my impression of the discourses around global university rankings are that they're becoming quite a dominant discourse within higher education and one that's perceived to be having quite significant and some problematic effects. Um, so let me present my, my research, which I suppose started from the angle of trying to look at um, whether to the extent to which we are captured by the discourse or whether there are you know, the, the, the alternative narratives which exist. I'll be talking mainly about some research that I did as part of my PhD and which is discussed in the paper which um, I've provided. Um, but if time permits, um, in the latter few minutes of the session, I would like to make some linking points to the theme of research impact, which I think is becoming another prevalent discourse within our domestic policy context. Um, because I think I see three possible sort of links and relationships between my own research and this um, increasingly um, a topical area. Um, firstly, in, in the theoretical focus I took in my study and the methodological approaches, um, I think, and I'll argue as I go through, this was with a concern for trying to achieve um, impact and engagement with um, colleagues in the sector who are being directly engaged in this discourse and affected by it, um, and trying to give some consideration to how the research can be made useful and accessible um, you know, at, at this point onwards. And secondly, I think that the whole um, topic of global rankings um, and its focus on particular research metrics um, can in some ways align with those that we see happening and being applied in the UK context, but in some areas can um, run in tension, um, which presents an interesting um, area, a challenge, I think, between UK uh, domestic higher education policy and international developments. And also what's becoming of increasing interest to me, having joined the faculty here, is the way in which the consideration of impact, research impact, and the impact of global rankings may be um, perceived or in actual fact be having different levels of impact at sector discipline um, and institutional levels. So just to begin, um, this phrase is one that I was, I've been so struck by the frequency of the assertion here and particularly struck by how frequently you see this referenced uh, within academic journal articles um, in a somewhat fatalistic way, um, a sense in which um, an ontological fact is being presented. Um, and to some extent, I think, obscures many of the active practices within the higher education community, which s help sustain the, the interest in rankings. So I suppose this reflects the, the, the particular way in which my, my interest was um, focused here. So I'd like to touch on um, a study I did, um, which I started, um, I published an article in 2013, but the research was really looking at um, between 2011 and 2012, looking at the research um, studies that have been applied, uh, investigating um, global university rankings. Um, in looking at those um, journal articles, those, those pieces of research, um, I used the framework um, which was developed by Professor Stanley Dietz to try and evaluate the different orientations being applied in research on rankings. Um, this is known as the research discourses framework. Um, so the horizontal axis of his framework distinguishes between research which takes an a priori um, stance um, and looking at, uh, the in this case, formulating global rankings as the central object of research and evaluating um, those artifacts in and of themselves. Contrasting with studies which are more local and emergent and perhaps more interested in looking at the way in which rankings are interpreted and applied in different contexts and situations. On the vertical axis, um, the framework distinguishes between studies and theoretical orientations which recognize um, conflict as um, 
normal and usual and um, would locate here on the dissensus end of the, the vertical axis and contrasting that with research orientations where there is a greater concern to try and align with the social order um, and studies which are trying to in some ways, um, in this case, in the case of rankings related research, um, studies which seem to show an orientation to trying to um, in some way improve the tool rankings um, and somehow make the, the situation that we find ourselves in more, more effective. My analysis showed that um, a greater number of studies could be located on the elite a priori um, spectrum of, the, of this research uh, framework, but that a smaller and productive vein of research could be located in the, um, on the Im local emergent um, part, and particularly in the top left quadrant, which is where we might be thinking of research which has a more dialogic orientation um, and it's really where I wanted to locate my own um, field of research. Um, in an earlier study, the, the work I'll be talking about today relates to the UK higher education context. Um, in a previous study, I had looked also at the role in which global university rankings seem to mediate um, interactions between um, UK higher education representatives and international um, partners. Um, and I was interested in, th in that study. In the very different ways these global rankings were sort of used to um, the roles they were playing and the ways in which they were mediating interactions and, and partnership development. So an, an update of this study when I was writing my thesis um, showed that actually the, there's an intensification of research that's located in this um, a priori sort of orientation and in, in, in sort of the period 2012, 2013, a lot more studies seem to be published which are of a much more tactical nature, you know, really sort of showing what um, management strategies might be effective in, in getting a, an enhanced ranking position, perhaps unsurprisingly. So, as I said, my study is located uh, with a particular interest within the UK higher education sector. Um, and I think it's a few points of interest and significance to me, having looked at, um, in an earlier study, in, in a, different, a number of different geographical contexts, it seemed that um, whereas in some other countries there's quite um, a government-led interest in rankings and some national policies that are perceived to be oriented towards boosting rankings position, um, the overt discourse around that was less evident at national policy level, but the uh, much more active engagement seemed to be evident within the higher education sector, which you know, showed a real proactivity in responding to rankings. Um, in terms of particularities of our context, I mean, sector enlargement and internationalization are not um, specific to the UK. Um, we perhaps, unlike some of the other countries that I've looked at um, in earlier work, we don't have a formal mission differentiation um, after you know, 1992. Um, but what we do see is quite a lot of proactive self-organization within the sector, which is reflected in different ways, but in my particular area of interest, in the formation and ac activities of um, mission groups. As I said, um, perhaps less o overt reference to the role of rankings and aspirations associated with rankings in the government policy discourse, but a very proactive response within the sector. So my research interest had been um, formulated initially in looking at the ways in which global rankings are influencing UK policy discourse. And through my research process, I slightly, um, I slightly moved from that initial position to a more nuanced question, I think, which was how different groups within the higher education sector were using rankings to influence policy. And actually that slight change in emphasis was very much a result of the role of uh, research participants within my study, which I will go on to discuss in a, sh in a few short moments. Um, so really I was looking at how the rankings discourse shapes and constitutes what, in my theoretical perspective, the activity um, system and, and how rankings are really mediating discourse 
I was looking particularly at some uh, lobbying documents that were produced by um, the then four mission groups um, in the period surrounding the UK general election in 2010. Um, I wonder, uh, people are probably familiar with many of these groups. And, you know, we, we have had the Russell Group established um, in 1994, which represents um, now sort of around about 25 um, UK universities, um, which describe themselves as research intensive. Um, the 1994 group um, formed in that same year um, represented, um, again, I think 18 universities, which de describe themselves as research intensive, teaching focused. Um, University Alliance um, represents um, 23 universities, which describe themselves as being more business engaged. And Million Plus is, um, describes itself as a think tank and represents 23 universities which have um, a particular interest in working, um, attracting student, um, a broad, a widening access sort of profile really and have a particular interest in um, the policy area of, of social mobility. So in terms of my um, interest in looking at these documents and my, my approach to examining them, um, I was using um, problematizing the analysis in terms of activity theory and drawing on the work of Engerstrom um, and his analytical concept of object-oriented activity. Um, I felt this form of analysis and a, um, a way of addressing the text was useful in that it reflects the role of um, activity being shaped by conceptual um, artifacts, but also material ones. In this case, um, the role of these rankings and the role of the language practices surrounding them. So having used that as my orientation, I wanted to find some, um, develop a, a methodological approach to examining the texts and to bring in um, some tools from critical discourse analysis to extend um, the tools available within activity systems theory. So I, I de de developed a twofold form of analysis. Um, firstly, I interpreted that the, the texts could be seen, the constitution of objects um, in, my, in my theoretical orientation could be determined in part by looking at the texts in terms of how they're located um, in the surrounding social practices, um, and particularly through analytical tools from critical discourse analysis of looking at the, the degree of intertextuality, you know, um, in particular terms, what government texts were these policy and lobbying documents seeking to respond to or indeed to anticipate and seek to influence and shape also, what genre characteristics did they reflect? Um, taking that as an indication of, you know, what was the anticipated practice these text producers were seeking to engage in? And also, um, it, again, to sort of situate the texts and, and deepen my own sort of contextual analysis, I was keen to involve a group, a panel of UK higher education representatives to look at my preliminary evaluation and, and analysis of how these texts could be located in, in surrounding activity and, and get their perspectives also. This panel included um, 11, 11, member, 11 higher education representatives, um, two who represented each of the, the universities represented by these four mission groups and three from sector bodies um, such as uh, HEFKI, British Council and the UK Higher Education International Unit. And from the university sector, it was a range of people in um, senior leadership, academic and management roles. So I'll be bringing in some of their um, contributions in, in a few minutes. A second part of my analytical focus was looking at how the, cons the object of activity um, reflected through these texts could be constituted through the internal relations within these texts, and specifically in terms of how social actors were represented um, through different forms of you know, wording that were being used. Um, 
the ways in which um, some social actors were foregrounded in, in, the, in the representation or indeed obscured within the, the textual representations. What kind of semantic relations were being constructed within these texts? Um, what forms of logic and argument were being um, progressed? And in some, to some extent, these were discourse, uh, sorry, genre related. Um, so in some of the texts, they were quite um, uh, concise leaflets and, and quite assertively expressed. Um, and in those cases, the degree of sort of logic and argument, um, it was more um, offered in the way of presumptions and assertions. Others were more you know, clearly, um, explicitly argued. But finally, I was then interested in looking at the way in which um, benchmarks were used explicitly in these texts to support the different claims and assertions that were being made and in particular terms, given my area of interest, how global rankings were being deployed to support different policy positions and to support different strategies of social change. So this diagram reflects that having looked at the degree of intertextuality within these documents, um, what this shows is that they all shared some common concerns. The, t the red font um, represents the texts, the anticipated texts that these texts, that, that the lobbying documents were trying to influence. So in the very center of the document, we have reference there for the then forthcoming Brown Review um, relating to student fees, the research excellence framework policy, and the um, imminent higher education funding cuts. However, the broader uh, representation of the intertextual references shows that they were quite, these were located in quite different um, spheres of concern. Um, the University Alliance text, for example, locates it very much within an economic discourse. It's relating um, quite directly to um, recent um, sp government speeches relating to economic growth strategy um, and is aiming at quite different, um, putting forward quite different policy proposals. Um, the 1994 group um, is, makes fewer intertextual references, but um, is perhaps unusual, uh, unlike all of the other texts, in asking and seeking quite a direct level of engagement with government in a, in a partnership sense, seeking a strategy for higher education. The, Rus the Russell Group text um, un was can be defined or distinguished from the other texts, I think, in having much considerably less regard for reference to government policy texts and documents, um, but has a, a wider focus, making more reference to intergovernmental, international intergovernmental texts, and seems to show um, a less of a domestic policy focus. So I was conceptualizing these lobbying documents as um, performative acts by each of these groups um, trying to put forward some uh, position, um, capture the government's attention, and put forward their, their collective interests of, of their member organizations. So based on the analysis that I've just touched on previously, using the analytical tools I've mentioned, this um, representation here shows that, you know, these, again, unsurprisingly, I, 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 I agree, the, the admission groups have put forward qualitatively different um, or expressed very different object orientations. Um, the University Alliance um, text is overtly uh, focused on economic recovery as, the, as the frame, framing the object, um, talking very much about sustainable growth, achieving a balanced economy, looking out beyond the higher education sector. The 1994 group is focused on more sectoral concerns about what uh, it sees the government's role as being in helping to maintain the qu quality and health of the sector in, in some sense, um, maintaining quality and standards, ensuring diversity and differentiation within the sector. Million plus, the object is framed really around an overall goal of enhancing social mobility and making the argument that that will contribute to UK effectiveness in economic and social terms. The Russell Group frames the object um, very much as ensuring national competitiveness 
but specifically through ensuring sustainable funding for leading research universities and seeking a public funding solution which achieves a greater concentration of research for those institutions. So these ob object orientations um, you know, are used and express very different um, proposed strategies of social change, of policy proposals. Um, the 1994 group is really advocating sector-wide um, policy strategies, which again are framed around maintaining standards, um, maintaining diversity, and of course um, ensuring quality. The University Alliance text is really about trying to um, enable transformation and growth within the higher education sector. Um, removing some of the constraints, um, de deregulating parts of the, the current framework, enabling growth. The Million Plus group is concerned in some part more with creating a more level playing field for those universities with inclusive student profiles and highlights in particular terms some of the policy, current policy at that time which was seen as deprivileging institutions with, with that sort of student profile and talks specifically around um, fee regimes for part-time students um, and so on. The Russell Group is um, in some ways distinct from the others in making very overt policy proposals um, centered around that particular group of institutions and making um, strong arguments for funding concentration um, of towards leading research universities. When looking at the international benchmarks that are actually used within these texts, it was, uh, you know, I found very surprising that, that very only the Russell Group, in fact, made reference to global rankings. None of the other um, mission groups did, um, which was surprising given that um, so much of what is we, we would read in the national press and in the, the, res the academic research literature sort of creates an impression that it's, it's all consuming. And, but um, in this selection of documents, which, you know, were, um, which, I, which I used in my analysis, um, it did seem to be quite a concentrated um, focus within those institutions represented by the Russell Group. But as you can see, um, I make the distinction between whether these benchmarks are used to explain a si the situation or to support some claims that are being made within the text, or whether the benchmarks are being used to help diagnose a problem and a, a scenario and in order to then make um, proposals for what needs to be done. What, I, what the analysis did show was that the Russell Group were using global rankings in each of these respects um, and my, my argument is that it's quite um, inculcated in their discourse, which, by which I mean um, Norman Fairclough would talk about the way in which um, terms, discourses can become, uh, ideas become projected through discourses. And first, firstly, as, um, he describes them as imaginaries, you know, people painting ideas, and, um, but subsequently, they can start to be inculcated and in actually shaping what is then done in material terms. And I, I found several examples in the Russell Group text where, you know, these rankings were being used in, in material ways. What we also see through this representation is that, um, you know, other groups, while so not using rankings at all, were using quite different measures of international um, university performance. And which reflected their own and different object orientations. This is just only to emphasize, just by the, the frequency of the yellow highlighted font, in the analysis I did, which is represented in much more detail here, this is all the places where the reference to global rankings or the international benchmarks which um, are related to rankings appeared within my analysis of the Russell Group text. So again, you know, wh why I'm saying it's a, a very inculcated discourse for that group. So th my provisional interpretation of, of the analysis I did on those texts led me to proposing that they constitute very different social relations within the higher education sector, both towards UK government and national policy concerns. It seemed the Russell Group text was much more oriented, oriented to 
international standing and comparisons with international um, competitors internationally, both in terms of national sectors and specific institutions. The other groups seem to be um, expressing much more of a discourse of partnership with UK government and seeing and depicting ways that they could work you know, in a partnership on areas of joint policy concern. I also suggest that the global rankings discourse connects with these policy strategies um, which advocate separation from sectoral interests. So the Russell Group is really arguing for policies that dis would advantage their own institutions at the expense of other institutions, which we didn't see so much, I, I didn't really see such, such evidence of in the other texts. So my, my suggestion was that this, this discourse, which in, in the way it's often depicted um, in the literature I had been reading, that it's having a sort of totalizing effect within um, national sectors, is actually entering our context in quite an uneven way and could be seen as having a narrowing effect in terms of the constructs of excellence being deployed, but uh, w only within part of the sector. And that there did seem to be alternative narratives which portrayed quite different contributions and sought different policy outcomes, which emphasized more the opportunities for growth, change, and transformation in the higher education sector. So what I just want to touch on now is the way that, um, having engaged in my own, this is my provisional analysis, I wanted to share that with the panel of representatives who had sort of worked and contributed throughout my own research process. So as I said, at the contextual analysis phase, I was interested in, in engaging with them then to see whether my own perception and understanding um, reflected their own um, perspective on the sector. This is where I was really trying to understand the social practices surrounding these texts, you know, what they were there to do, who would have been inclined to read them. Obviously, they're aimed at the government, but what other audiences and what was their perception of the, 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 the ongoing effects? Um, so the first quote here reflects that I, I, I'd observed that there was very little um, overt reference to rankings in government policy terms. And this seemed to be reflected in the quote from a policy advisor from UK Higher Education International Unit, which is a jointly funded unit by many of the, the national bodies. Um, UK conversation is more sophisticated um, because we have domestic rankings. And of course we hear, you know, we have our market reforms driving quality. Um, so there was some sort of sense that uh, a shared, you know, a chiming there. Um, and this um, sense here that my, my perception that rankings, you know, could be having, or were having material effects and shaping practice, not just being deployed in the discourse for, you know, marketing statements and publicity material, but actually shaping practice. Um, the, the quote from the Pro Vice Chancellor from a Russell Group institution here, you know, does suggest that in a very real way, um, this particular regard for global rankings position is creating quite a risk aversion in the way that um, institutions are operating in regard to the way that they might approach higher education partnerships, the type of institution they're willing to partner with. Um, so she, she presents quite an interesting um, reflection on the, some of the ways that it can be used as a useful heuristic internally in the institution and can be useful up to a point, but what she's highlighting some of the, the more serious um, outward facing effects. I was also interested in um, how these, you know, again, the, how these discourses, the, the texts I was looking at, how they related to wider activities. So this quote here reflects that, you know, not many people really would be sitting down and reading those lobbying documents. They're addressed to government largely, but it was suggested here from uh, a representative from the University Alliance Institution that, you know, a very significant audience for those texts would be the vice chancellors themselves it, in a way, in a slightly, you know, perhaps a reflexive way in order to see, you know, does this um, interest group, this membership um, mission group continue to reflect my interests, my institutional interests, um, 
And that's become quite relevant and pertinent, given that one of the groups, the 1994 group, disbanded in 2013. So what had represented, you know, in the region of 20 universities, has ceased to exist. Um, and, you know, many of the reasons given in the press statements by departing institutions was that it no longer reflected their, you know, their institutional interests. And it's reflected here that, you know, one of the institutions who, who left the University of Bath, um, you know, specifically highlighted this in their press statement when um, announcing their departure. And finally, when I um, reached the end of my own sort of analysis of the text, I, I shared, um, you know, a sort of summary of that and my provisional interpretation with this panel. And again, asked them, you know, to sort of provide their perspectives and a sense of what, um, what effects they, could, um, ex they were experiencing with the, the, global, the discourse around global rankings. So here is a, a, a three, it's quite a long quote, so I'll just present it sort of step by step, but from a, a representative from a university alliance institution who reflects that um, at the time that my study was sort of getting underway, they were quite focused on global rankings position as well as domestic ranking position. Um, and it was written explicitly into their strategic plan. But there was an awareness, and he's indicating that, you know, the, the current context, as was local context, was changing, and there were several reasons affecting their own institutional thoughts about the relevance of pursuing a rankings position. Um, so they're much more focused around employability, both national and international, much more focused about representing their strengths in terms of industry engagement and partnership. Um, and, you know, describes their feeling that there is now a new narrative within their own institution, um, which is much less tied to global rankings and more about differentiation from other UK um, institutions within the sector. So he finishes by saying, recognition of our new context has resulted in a realization that we can't compete with Russell Group institutions or aspire to be like them, but we really do have something else. Um, quite a positive move, really. So to just, I'm nearly sort of reaching the end now in my sort of, um, but just to sort of ref compare that with, um, I had looked at the mission statements and strategic plans of the universities represented by Russell Group and 1994 Group in 2012. And I was distinguishing between those universities who expressed um, an explicit top line strategic goal of attaining a particular ranking position. And I distinguished between others who were more talking about the role of rankings in forming one of their several performance indicators of progress towards a, a strategic goal and those which didn't feature rankings at all in their strategic plan. So this was the picture that we had in 2012. Um, and you can see it's quite evenly distributed between, you know, the, the similar sort of distribution between the two mission groups. In 2015, having looked at those again, um, there's still, you know, there's a drift towards, um, you know, the, the the deployment of rankings in more institutions than had been the case in, in 2012, which you know, won't perhaps surprise you. Um, and the institutions represented in red are ones which um, were invited to join the Russell Group, um, who had previously been members of the 1994 group. Um, but I think what's in interesting as well is there is still quite a significant number of universities within the third column who are not, you know, um, referencing um, a global rankings target in their, you know, top three um, goals and objectives. So my conclusions from my study really are that, um, and using my, you know, theoretical perspective of object orientation, is that rankings um, can be seen in my, in terms of my study, as fragmenting the object as various actors position themselves differently with respect to this artifact. And in some senses, in that process, reconsider their object, which I think came through in the, the long quote that I used and just showed a minute ago from the University Alliance representative. Um, 
I think the research perspective of using critical discourse analysis helps to illustrate how rankings are used in the discourse, you know, in whether they're used in this more superficial way um, um, or, or in a more inculcated um, way, which I've discussed, and helps to explore where power is embedded in these micro practice, day-to-day -day practices. Um, and I feel that this research orientation potentially is amenable to more practice-based responses and more participatory. Um, having looked in my study where I looked at the research discourses in, in, in the study of the literature, so many of um, the articles were really written in policy-oriented journals and seemingly addressed towards um, policy and, and senior leadership communities and much less available that was useful for people in, in um, roles outside of those, you know, in terms of feeling therefore quite um, fatalistic and constrained by the discourse of ranking. So my paper sort of ends on, on how and to what extent the research approach can help provide some resources for new practices. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave, I'll stop now <laughs> and, and indicated some of the sort of response options that um, through my research and associated readings and some work I've done since that for me seem like some of the response options available to rankings but I'd really really welcome your reactions and comments and thoughts thank you